Welcome. I'm going to talk all about go kits. The only thing I'm not going to talk about is what is a go kit. The problem with amateur radio, no, it's not the problem with amateur radio. The problem with hams is if you ask two hams for an opinion, you're going to have five answers and go kits is no different. So I'm going to focus on the equipment itself and a wee bit on kind of the human comfort aspects of operating. Um, because operating away from home contains more elements to it than I've got time to spend with you, but I'm going to touch on just a few of them. I've been operating portable for almost 20 years. I'm going to tour you through my kit that was born after um, my experience primarily in the 2013 Southern Alberta floods. And you can see all those stories on my website and a whole bunch of uh, public service events where things went really unexpectedly wrong. So I'm going to start by focusing on GoKit design considerations. There are so many options available to you. It's my hope that uh, by the end of my slide deck this evening, that you'll have gained some ideas for your own. Um, a little bit of background about me is that I was interested in amateur radio at age seven and licensed at 40. Uh, some could say I'm a slow starter. You wouldn't be too far wrong in this case. Um, I do six, at one point I was doing probably 12 public service events per year. Lately, I'm doing about six, but my very first event for me was a tremendously fulfilling learning experience. I'm certified in ICS at the 300 level. Um, I am the Aries Oxcom uh, ass Assistant Emergency Coordinator. I think that's going to be what the title is. Uh, Oxcom is a new title, don't mind me, for the Alberta Foothills area. I'm a podcast team member. Um, I'm the slacker on the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, hamradioworkbench.com, if you're so interested. Uh, I help out with repeaters and projects in my club in the Foothills Amateur Radio Society. Uh, I learn every day from, uh, from guys like Dan St. Pierre and, uh, and Peter Rizdahl uh, as I work on those things and, uh, and Jerry McDonald. Um, I build stuff for my radios to make my hobby more enjoyable. So that's my radio side. Uh, when I'm not picking up a microphone or um, mangling my way through a CW contact, uh, I scuba dive and uh, I've been playing music since uh, 1969 and I'm self-certified with respect to playing music. So I want to talk firstly about go kit types. Let's get to the basics. So as I said earlier, if you ask two hams for a definition of a go kit, you're going to get five answers. <laughs> The variety notwithstanding, I'm going to attempt to keep it simple. Go kits fall into two main categories. Those that fit into a bag of some sort, either a backpack or maybe a camera bag or a laptop bag uh, or something more, uh, more commercially available like from uh, Tom Bin or, or whomever. And those that fit into a box of some sort, an enclosure, a 19-inch rack mount case, like the Gator case uh, is very popular, a plastic suitcase. I think of the Pelican or the Nanook uh, cases when I say that, or something uh, built to suit. And then there's two subcategories um, for uh, kits in that they're battery powered or grid powered. So let's just keep that in the back of Keep that in the back of your mind. So what's in a kit? Well, first off, let me uh, talk about, there's some great photos here that I'm sprinkling throughout the presentation. And these are everybody else's. Uh, as I went doing uh, my research, uh, you can see a, a great uh, kit laid out all on the ground from uh, 4I1BHP. Uh, and just with a wonderful variety of things. Uh, in the upper left is uh, from my friend Thomas, uh, Kilo 4 Sierra Whiskey Lima. He publishes uh, YouTube uh, videos uh, multiple times a week. He writes a great uh, blog uh, and his world is all about portable operating and he takes out a different piece of kit each time. I asked him if he would adopt me. He's got that many transceivers. So... All kits have at least uh, these items. They have a radio and some sort of power distribution or power connectivity, right? Beyond the box or the bag, you're gonna need a few things to go with them. Some antennas, some antenna supports, some feed line, power cables. And I have underlined 
manuals for your gear because you're going to get out in the field for whatever your purpose is parks on the air summits on the air car rally uh a flooding event <laughs> and you're not going to remember how to do something you need some sort of manual with you please bring your manuals with you especially when you do events so some kits have these things in them as well remember i said the radio and the battery so they have more than one radio they have a microphone now you're scratching your head going well what do you mean they have a microphone well maybe it's a cw only kit so the the fellow who packed the kit or the lady who packed the kit might have only put a cw key in it uh, and the reverse is also true a digital interface a computer a power meter an antenna tuner uh, external speakers uh, battery charger solar panel some way to get electricity into the kit and then this the aforementioned stuff to make your life easier paper pencil pen sharpie clipboard notebook highlighter tape coffee mug water bottle uh, some snacks first aid kit um, fresh clothing boy nothing ruins your day worse than cold wet feet carry an extra pair of socks with you when you go out in the field uh, and thank me later um, uh, some food to snack on uh, lighting uh, in case it uh, starts to get dark around you uh, and a poncho which has multiple purposes beyond uh, keeping yourself dry it can be thrown over your own gear at a pinch if you're, uh, would you kindly all mute, please? I'm hearing a bit of background noise. Thank you. So first off, I want to talk about what's your purpose. I'm a really strong supporter of building kit for a purpose. It's really about the basics of setting your goals and building or working towards them. On screen are uh, photos of uh, various kits from various sources and for various purposes uh, the hard shell packed case with a nice metal plate the hard shell packed case with a nice metal plate on it um, the case in uh, some sort of an ammo box the gator case a handmade wooden case another one of a thomas's kit and i don't know who this uh this kit came from but they're, you know, VHF, UHF radios, as opposed to HF on the panel on the left. They're all there for various purposes. So first off, you need to define your purposes. So let me give you some thinking points about that. First off, why are you building a kit? Are you going camping? Do you do events? Are you doing OXCOM support? Where are you going to use it? On a picnic table, inside, on a top of a mountain? What frequencies are you going to operate? HF, VHF, UHF, what operating modes are you going to be on? CW, digital voice, what's your operating power level? Five watts, 100? What's the purpose for your contacts, your QSOs? Is it casual? You get what you get. Is it a contest? You get as many as you can. Is it emergency comms? You got to get it all. Define all of those things. So these are just a sampling of things to ask yourself before you pick up a screwdriver, a soldering iron, or a radio. And all of the things here on this page are going to drive out the rest of your limitations, uh, which are coming right up. So let's talk about um, your electrical requirements. What's your source of power? Do you plan to use it off commercial mains power? Find a plug somewhere. Uh, are you going to hump around a generator? Are you going to use battery? It's going to be solar. Uh, once again, operating power level is key as you think about electrical requirements. What's your operating time? Is it a few hours? Is it a few minutes? In the case of a, a soda contact, as Ken would tell you, he, he goes up and he's got a budget for time because if he, uh, if he stays too long, it gets way too dark by the time he comes back. Uh, are you going to be unlimited on the air? You don't know how long you're going to be. That's another way to say it. And then how far is your power away? Is it close by or is it, uh, is it distant? You know, a few hundred feet away, as the case might be. So before we go too much further, I want to do a bit of a sidebar for battery. In my mind, a go kit does not mean it has a battery. Um, and, and as I've said a couple of times now, if you ask multiple hams for a definition of a go kit, you're going to get... Mm, um, 
n plus or n squared plus one as an answer on what they think a go kit is. So in in my world, a go kit doesn't have to have a battery. Um, so let's do the math computing for a battery for a moment. We're going to use uh, some assumptions here on screen. Um, let's we've got a Yaesu 8900 FM, FM rig on VHF at 50 watts. Uh, the assumption is the station is a busy event net control station talking 40% of the time and listening 60% of the time. That'd be busy indeed. Uh, the assumption is it's an eight hour window. It's, so let's crack open the manual. Remember the manual, the thing that uh, most people uh, don't really like reading. Well, so the 8900 manual says transmit current on that particular radio is eight amperes and the received current is decimal eight amperes. So let's start the math through. On the next line, transmit time is eight hours times 40% of the time times eight amperes is 25.6 amp hours. So far, so good. The receive time, which is gonna to add to the transmit time is eight hours times 60% of the time times zero decimal eight amperes or 3.84 amp hours. So adding the two together, we need 29.44 amp hours of battery required. Now I'll note that you need to add battery or supplemental charging to allow for overtime operation or cold weather or voltage sag. I am making no assumption as to the battery chemistry or the battery type. I'm simply talking about consumption by the way, but it's key, add up all of the devices in your kit and figure out all of that, all of their individual elements, power consumption, add them all up in order to come to that, uh, to that total. Now, power consumption duty cycle varies by mode. And note, I'm talking about power consumption duty cycle, not transmitter duty cycle here. Um, the rules of thumb that, uh, that I've always relied upon when I'm doing my planning and it hasn't steered me too far wrong is that for uh, a transmitter for a busy station, um, FM uh, 40, 60, 40% uh, of the time you're transmitting, 60% of the time you're listening, uh, digital mode the same. And because FM, digital and CW are all 100% duty cycle transmitters, it's pretty easy to say that you can, uh, that your battery consumption will match that. Sideband is a little bit less because the way the modulation envelope is shaped, uh, sideband is more like 2575. Excuse me. If you're operating off the 120 volt mains, you need just enough of a 12 volt power supply in your kit to run all your devices concurrently. So operating off mains is way simpler from a math perspective, though it may be way heavier from a, an extension cord perspective. So um, let's come back to more requirements or limitations, if you will. Think about now your mechanical requirements uh, and how big it is, how much it weighs. Um, your purpose is really going to determine the size of your gear and therefore your kit. If you believe in defining your purpose first and working backwards to your build, that's, that's one of the pieces. So here's some things to consider about the mechanical or physical limitations of your gear. Um, do you want your kit? Is your kit tiny? Do you carry it one hand? Is it luggable? Do you need a crew of roadies and a bus? or some transport trucks. Um, how, much, how much does it weigh? Three, 10, 50 pounds? What, uh, what form factor design is it? Is it in a small bag you can carry in a hand? Is it a backpack, a strap, a strap on your back? Is it a suitcase or pelican case? Do you need a dedicated vehicle for it? Uh, and where are you gonna set it up? Is it gonna be sitting on a table? Is it gonna be sitting on the ground? Are you going to wear it on your body, maybe uh, in some sort of a, a harness around your neck or what have you? So with all of those things in the background, let me give you a tour through my kit. Um, now that you've got a list of how to determine your own requirements, uh, here's, here's my requirements and, uh, and my kit and how I came to the conclusions that I did uh, with my own build. So my design requirements are to operate uh, indoors. I'm either in the emergency operations center, I'm in logistics or net control, or I'm out glamping. That's glamorous camping if you've not heard the word. 
uh, the um, from time to time I'm operating out in the field, but I'm well equipped uh, in my vehicle, so my my go kit doesn't play a part in cases like that. My power is uh, operating off 120 volt mains. Uh, 12 volt DC is optional, kind of a just in case thing. The frequencies I want to operate on are from 80 meters up to UHF, 70 centimeters. The modes I operate on are primarily phone with CW and digital as optional. Uh, my operating power level is up to 100 watts. It varies depending on the event, of course, or the purpose. Uh, and the purpose itself is either event support, uh, disaster, OXCOM support, or lamping. Um, for me, my must-have items are that I must have multiple concurrent VHF or UHF VFOs. And, you know, a reminder that the, our friends from the military say two is one and one is none when they're talking about redundancy. Uh, for me, an externally amplified speaker uh, is mandatory, as is a headphone distribution amp. So multiple people can be listening at a level that is comfortable for them. And uh, for me, the mechanical weight limitations and size limitations are such that each piece has to be one arm carryable and rugged enough for transport so that I don't have to worry about it too much. So from the operator point of view, uh, this is what my kit looks like. I'm going to give you an in-depth tour of my kit over the next several slides, but here's what it looks like sitting in front of me uh, with the power switched off. I, I need you first off to imagine that there's some cables coming off the top of the radios or off the side, as case might be, um, for antennas that I didn't set up for taking these photos, but you'll see later on in other photos. My kit is primarily housed in Pelican uh, 1500 uh, cases as that's what I had on hand when I built my kit up. Um, not shown as one more Pelican 1500 and Anvil road case, um, slightly bigger than a, a, a standard briefcase to carry my extra items around in a safe and protected manner. So here's an elevated view taken from overhead. Um, boy, there's a lot going on here, but my purpose is that I want my home station replicated on a six foot wide table while I'm out and about and I can do it with this setup. And I don't need all of this to, uh, to support it, but certainly it's nice to have the full kit, uh, especially when I'm operating HF. Uh, from, uh, from left to right at the top of the screen, you can see that I have a drop-in charger for my uh, very favorite Yaesu VX7 uh, handhelds, and I have two of those and spare batteries for each. I have one of two external speakers. I have a creature comfort device. That's a cooling fan that runs off USB 5 volts. Um, I have 12 volt uh, power distribution in the left hand case uh, in the form of a, a small uh, uh, power pole distribution strip. Um, moving into the right hand case at the rear underneath the floor of the radios, I have a, a 120 to 12 volt uh, power supply, another external speaker. Then you can see uh, a 50 amp hour 12 volt LifePo 4 battery kit. That's a project that's uh, in flight at the moment. Excuse me. Uh, from left to right along the bottom, I have my Winlink to go packet radio kit built into a, a little Pelican case. Uh, it's a five watt UHF data radio and a TNC. Uh, moving into the left kit, I have my headphone distribution amp. And I'll note that one channel uh, has been hardware hacked to drive out a two and a half watt speaker or two and a half watts to a speaker with a, an LM386 module. The other channels are uh, strictly at headphone level. I have an LDG Z11 Pro 2 uh, HF to six meter tuner, except no substitute than LDG. Uh, LDG made me uh, very happy with their excellent customer service. They have me as a customer for life. Uh, I have a SignalLink USB uh, external sound card. Moving into the right hand case, I have uh, an FT8800 uh, dual band radio, which is cross band capable. So it's simultaneous dual VFO. I have a, a Yaesu FT857 uh, all mode radio. Uh, that covers uh, 160 meters up to UHF. Um, the so-called shack in a box radio is one of the few of those that are still, uh, that you can still get your hands on. I have an LDG FT meter so that I can observe more than one thing at a time when I am transmitting. And then lastly, on the uh, lower right corner, I have my Panasonic Toughbook CF53. It's a, an i5 with eight gig of RAM and an SSD installed in it and Windows 7. 
I could talk about that all on its own. Moving to underneath the uh, cases now. So imagine if you will, I've lifted up those, uh, those panels where the, the gear is sitting on and the left-hand kit, I have an assortment of RF adapters that I carry with me, uh, inter-series uh, gender changers. I have some short uh, RG400 jumper cables uh, with BNCs on each end. Uh, primarily they are set up so that when I drop into uh, my glamper, uh, I have um, a terminal strip on the wall where my antennas feed in. So I connect that over to my kit and uh, I'm ready to go. I have some 12 volt to USB uh, jumper cables uh, in the upper right corner of the left hand box. Uh, moving over into the right hand box, I have a cat cable for my 857. Um, I have a 12 volt cable that runs over for power distribution to the left hand case. And then I have uh, one inch wide grounding cables. These are five and 10 feet long. Uh, they are they're color coded so I know which one's which. I, yes, I can join them together if I need 15 feet of grounding uh, to get my station properly grounded in that location that I'm working in. I have a PowerWorks brand 30 amp year supply. Uh, and of course it runs off of uh, AC. The PowerWorks brand uh, supply that I have is bare bones. It's got a power switch on the front and some binder posts on the back. There's no fancy meters or anything on it. I purchased it, A, because it was cheap <laughs> and B, because it was tiny and it fits in this case very nicely. Uh, along the bottom from left to right, I have one of my two external speakers. You can see my creature comfort device there, uh, kind of laying out, that's where it's stored. Um, in the, the right-hand box, I have a headphone extension cable in the event that the phones I'm carrying with me, the my Sony headphones have, have about a four foot cable on them. They're designed for music listening, not radio operating. I have a, my second external speaker. Um, both my external speakers not only have a hook in the back that I can hang them up as you saw in the prior photos, but they have some rare earth magnets uh, self-adhered to the bottom. So I can sit them right on top of the radio and they don't slide anywhere if that's how I choose to operate them. Uh, I have the very famous Workman brand, uh, 19 inch dual band magnet antenna, the kind of the little rare earth in the bottom, rare earth magnet in the bottom. I have two of those in the kit because I have two radios that are capable of running via UHF. Um, in a pinch, I can use those antennas. They stay in these Pelican cases. And then you can see I've got a spot, um, very professionally stenciled out FT meter. Uh, that was written in place. Uh, that's my handwriting with uh, a Sharpie marker. But um, in that way, I know what goes where as I'm putting the uh, case back together. So you're looking at this going, wow, this is a lot of stuff. Yeah, it is a lot of stuff. And it takes me five minutes to set up because it's in, in my mind, incredibly well organized and designed to be set up fast. What's the other gear I carry with me? So look, first off, clearly, I'm not going out with Ken and Malin and Ian and doing soda activities with all this kit, right? Um, but if I did, I imagine I, I'd probably be in the best shape of my life, uh, notwithstanding. What else have I got here? I've got uh, three 50-foot chunks of RG400 feed line uh, and spares. The RG400 is um, it's RG8X sized. Uh, it's very low loss. Uh, it's, it approaches LMR400. Uh, it is uh, Teflon coated. It coils up very nicely, uh, incredibly durable as a result. I have an 80, 40, 20 meter fan dipole that I uh, scratch built. And you'll see a photo of that in a bit. I have a Comet HFJ 350M vertical uh, and a tripod that I use if uh, I just need to set up something fast for HF. Um, it's good to 100 watts. I have a Diamond to X50. Uh, collinear UHF antenna that goes on top of my 30 foot push up mast that comes along with guy ropes and stakes. And they're all pre measured and again designed for a quick deployment. I can put all of this kit up in 60 minutes uh, if I'm uh, set up with my uh, glamper um, because it's all uh, pre wired for it, of course. Turn that radio down so you don't have to listen to it. I carry 120 volt AC extension cables with me because remember that uh, I am primarily operating uh, from mains power. I carry headphones with me. I've got a set of Sony's as I mentioned and I have a HAL Pro 7. Um, I carry a CW key. You saw that in one of the photos. It's a, a Begali Traveler. It's wonderful. 
uh, Panasonic CF53 Toughbook laptop computer, which is uh, serves multiple purposes for me. It runs logging software and a few other things, and I have a few slides on that a bit later on. I carry problem solvers with me. These are born from years and years of going, oh, I wish I had that with me. Now I do. 3M blue painter's tape, except no substitutes. You can hang a sheet of paper anywhere with this stuff and you won't remove the finish when you take it off. I carry an assortment of Sharpie markers with me, including metallic ones so I can do labeling. Paper, pen, pencil, clipboards. I carry dollar store carabiners and Lee Valley Tools rare earth magnetic hooks, except no substitute. You'll see why on the next slide. I carry a set of hand and soldering tools. Now you might start to think to yourself, this is one heck of a big go kit. Keep in mind, my purpose is also emergency communications. And if I have to stop and fix a piece of gear to get a, a message out, I will. Uh, I carry extra feed line with me, usually 100 feet of RG8X uh, on top of all my other feed lines so that I've got a spare. I carry extra VUHF uh, mag mount whips and an antenna analyzer. Um, when I can figure out, so that I can figure out what's going wrong and when it's going wrong. So from left to right, here's the headphone amp uh, that I've already talked about a little bit. Now it's up close. Uh, you can see the LM317 module in the uh, in the photo, um, and you can see where I've modified one of them to say it's speaker level output. It translate to please don't plug your headphones in there, or else it'll hurt. Uh, but in doing this, I can have multiple people listening at a level that is comfortable for them. And I can drive an external speaker so the people in the room around me can hear if that's their choice, or I can turn it down if that's not their choice. Um, in the center, you remember I said about all those extra antennas and that feed line listed. I, I don't know if you can really see it here, but you might be able to make out a whip antenna on top of what appears to be a dumpster. Yep, that's a dumpster. I'll tell you that's a dumpster. Uh, and that's what I called my dumpster top repeater. Um, and a, a few years ago at the big white winter rally outside of Kelowna, the, uh, the primary repeater uh, had failed and we don't know why it failed. It, it just stopped. Um, and everybody, it was our last run of the day and everybody was in getting in position or in position and the repeater dropped. Nobody could uh, hear me shouting out to them to say, please switch over to the backup repeater because I was operating uh, inside with a 19 inch whip inside the, uh, the ski hut at the uh, bottom of the hill. At the top of the hill was said repeater that failed. So I didn't have a lot of power and I didn't have a lot of antenna because I didn't need it that day. And so I, I reached into my kit and grabbed 100 feet of feed line and ran outside and hastily cleaned off the snow on top of the, uh, the dumpster. And I dropped the antenna in and somebody grabbed the feed line, fed it through the window, and I connected it hastily to my radio. And I began transmitting on the output frequency of said dead repeater, telling everybody to switch over to the backup repeater. Uh, my other net control operator was sitting with me and verified that people were coming over. And that's the story of the dumpster repeater or the dumpster antenna. Uh, and then lastly, on the right, you heard me say dollar store carabiners. You're not going to carry anything with these except feed lines and those Lee Valley magnetic hooks. They hook onto everything. And uh, don't buy the cheap ones at, you know, the orange box store, the blue box uh, home improvement store. Buy the Lee Valley tools one because they really are made that much better. Um, they make an excellent way for simple cable management. You don't have to run anything on the floor doing this. Just find something magnetic in the ceiling and hook it up onto it. Uh, a fluorescent light fixture, a steel beam, as you see here, T-bar dropped ceilings uh, in most um, commercial locations. All of these things make great ways to get cable uh, up and out. So from my portable kit and now a little bit into my glamping setup, uh, I love operating on the picnic table. I think in the uh, upper left uh, corner, upper left photo, you can, uh, you can see um, my, uh, my favorite 807 uh, Coors Banquet uh, sitting there and possibly a little bowl of snacks. Um, and you can see a, a chair set. Uh, upside down or on its side on the table. I, in this case, it's providing um, 
shade from the sun and the light so that I can see my laptop screen and I don't uh, overheat my radio. So I am on underneath my canopy, but the angle the sun was at at that time of day was uh, bearing down on my gear. So remember the poncho I mentioned earlier, it can also be pushed into service to do this. In the lower left corner, you can see that my kit fits uh, fairly nicely on the desk and the inside of uh, my RV. Um, the big photo in the middle shows uh, my RV with the 30 foot mast and uh, the multi-band uh, uh, dipole set up as an inverted V. This, is, this photo was taken at a campground in uh, Creston, BC. And then lastly on the right, you can see how I bring in feed lines uh, from the outside to the inside on uh, my slide out, uh, the, the slide out uh, in, in the back here that I'm circling with my mouse and I hope you can see it. Um, that's where that desk sits in that tip out. And there was a, a really interesting piece of technology there that was already a wiring pass through and it was for this thing called a phone line. I don't know if you've ever heard of a phone line but I haven't used one in a while. So I repurposed it with this. Uh, I cut a slightly bigger hole. I used some a Decora plate with waterproof cover on it. And these are BNC connectors. It's about a 12 inch jumper in the wall between these two. And then a throwback to my uh, broadcasting, uh, my, my very short, uh, non, very, not very well lived broadcasting career. Uh, I've coded them red, green, and blue. So about the computer, the computer itself is a Panasonic Toughbook CF53 Mark IV. There's a lot of people who do portable ops. If you watch a lot of the YouTubers, they love the Panasonic Toughbook. There's uh, guys like Julian OHS, excuse me, OH8STN, who believe in uh, Windows Surface tablets. Uh, there's something for everybody out there. Uh, figure out your computing platform and, and ride that horse for a while and see if it works for you. In my case, um, I've, I've used Mac for uh, a decade or more now. Uh, however, much of the software that I need to operate my radios and program them in the field is Windows based. So I standardized on a Windows based computer and Windows 7 in this case. Uh, Windows 10 has uh, several things that uh, drive us crazy, including uh, continually updating drivers when you didn't ask it to, which means you have to reconfigure things uh, constantly. And a lot of the drivers for the radios that I program, uh, they're only supported to Windows XP and in some cases DOS. So I needed a Windows 7 computer where virtualization was easy and I could uh, make sure that all of the, the radio software that I need to work with, uh, programming a Max track, programming a ASU, uh, programming my, um, my data radio, uh, I could do all of that from this. So this machine serves two purposes. Its secondary purpose is to be with me as a field computer for field operating. Its primary purpose is as a diagnostic tool. What I like about it beyond the nice integrated handle is it's it's got a magnesium alloy case. So I can put it in the back seat of my truck. And if I forget to seat belt it in, I'm not going to cry about it. Uh, it's got really good long battery life. I'm really very pleased with it. It's not a speed demon in terms of a processor, but it doesn't need to be. It's got a daylight viewable screen. It's not the highest risk screen in the world, but it's certainly good enough. It's six pounds and it's got all the IO ports that you can imagine and then some. Um, including the very important uh, nine pin serial port. These are about $500 in the used marketplace and they're fairly common uh, in a variety of places. What's on the computer um, and it's Windows 7, uh, why that old operating system, as, as I've said, it's as I need to program uh, older radios that will only program up under Windows XP or under uh, the disk operating system under DOS. So Windows 7 was an easy platform to virtualize those other ones on uh, as opposed to others. It's Windows 7 is stable, it runs well. Um, it's directly supported by this manufacturer of computer, Panasonic, on this model of computer with manufacturer written drivers. Um, and then I also use uh, Sys internals tools uh, with virtual desktops to keep desktop uh, clutter down to a minimum so that I don't have 84 windows laying on top of each other. Uh, other items that I run on it, Winlink Express, Vera, via, Vera FM and HF. Uh, I also configure this to use with my Winlink to go kit. 
Um, digital mode software, Ham Radio Deluxe DM780, uh, I still fall back to that uh, from time to time, although I'm more of an FL Digi kind of guy, FL Rig, uh, WSJTX. I have the SDR software for my SDR play. Um, it connects to my high impedance pan adapter tap that's in my FT857 in the kit uh, from Kilo 2 Delta. Oops, Kilo Delta 2 Charlie. I usually mix that up. Um, I have programming software for all the radios that I own. Uh, I have TNC management software, and it's my field diagnostic tool. So my requirements are kind of simple. I need Windows 7 to program a few radios and do some digital modes. So it seems to be a whole bunch more than that, though, right? So look, in summary, as you start to think of building up your own kit, think about the kepner trigo method of determining things. Uh, that is what it is that you must have and what it is that would be nice to have. I made that evaluation for every single piece in my kit. Evaluate your purpose, your locations for use, your mechanical considerations. How big do you want it to be? I don't think Ken would want to hump this kid up the hill, although it'd be kind of fun to get it up there. Um, and then th remember that your purpose, your electrical and your mechanical design elements are going to determine the kit's functionality and therefore then its building points. You can have a kit with narrow focus and it'll be lightweight, but a highly flexible kit is anything but lightweight. So with that thought, I leave you, there's a whole bunch more elements uh, involved in operating away from home. Uh, this equipment is just focused on the present on the equipment. This presentation is just focused on the equipment. I'm having trouble reading sentences tonight and a wee bit on the human comfort aspects. I hope you found this thought provoking uh, as you start to think about uh, developing your own kit. Thank you so much.